Hello and welcome to the Daily Milk for Tuesday the 14th of February 2023. Today was a match day, it was a double match day, and uh, we'll get into it now. So here we go. Uh, yeah, Millwall played Coventry City and lost 1 0 in what was quite an insipid performance. Um, and to be honest, I it's exactly what I expected. And if you saw yesterday's video, you say I predicted the one nil win for Millwall, but I said, I said, Gary Rowe has done does what he did previously, and that's when the team has a good performance on a Saturday and they have a game on a Tuesday, he doesn't make any changes, we will lose this game. And not only did we lose it, we were so so poor until. Until when we started losing, he made his attacking changes. He suddenly, he probably switched it. Told them, "Oh, you can start attacking now." And then it was like it was a different Millwall. It was a completely different team. Um, but yeah, so this is the match report from uh, SouthernNews.co.uk. Uh, Victor Gakira's thunderbolt was enough to drop the Lions down to seventh in the championship table. And the reminder: seventh is. Outside the playoffs, uh, Mill were handed their second championship defeat of the 2023 as Coventry City ran out 1 0 winners on a cold Tuesday night. Coventry were on the front foot throughout the second half as they pushed throughout the first half. Coventry City were on the front foot throughout the first half. Why would you write the second half? It's like the second line of the match report. I think that's a mistake. First half, as they pushed for the opening goal, but the Lions managed to frustrate them despite failing to really threaten them in the final third. The second half was much of the same, although a referee, Matthew Donahue, took centre stage with a number of yellow cards and controversial decisions. However, in the 66 minute, Victor Gikiris screamed a rifle past George Norman to give the Sky Blues a 1 0 lead. Mill pushed for an equaliser deep into stoppage time, but their efforts came too late, and Mark Robbins' side were able to hold on. To pick up all three points at the Coventry Building Society Arena. The match details Coventry's game plan was clear from the opening two minutes of the game as they pushed forward in search of an early goal. They won two early corners uh, with the with the first and the first was kicked straight out of play by Gustavo Hamer, while the second was flicked wide by Carl McFadzian, who scored early on from a set piece in a reverse fixture at the den in August. They had a better chance in the 12th minute when a new attack broke down. Victor Kikiris left uh, the ball for Casey Palmer, who raced through on goal, setting up Kikiris on his right to smack a powerful effort straight into the gloves of George Long. It took until the 18th minute for the Lions to threaten in the final third, but Zion Fleming and Duncan Watmore were both caught out by the host's high line that still caught them in an offside position. Coventry went back to dominating the game immediately after with Giacchiris cutting onto his right foot inside the box and curling the left narrowly over the post. Minutes later, Palmer combined with Jake Bidwell to play the former into the penalty area, but his tame shot bobbled well wide of the target with the attacking midfielder furious that referee Matthew Donoghue bowed to award a corner. While Billy Mitchell was the first player to pick up a yellow card for a heavy tackle on Hamer, Millwall were unlucky to not be awarded a penalty shortly after a foul mark. Uh, Coventry were carved open by a Danny McNamara pass. They found a dual Honeyman with the uh, Sunderland Academy graduate in turn finding Tom Bradshaw in the box. And a fancy and brought him down, but no foul was awarded. Long was called into action once again in the 33rd minute when Palmer sneaks into the box, but his effort was tame. Easily palmed away by the Mill goalkeeper before McNamara cleared for a throw in. Ten minutes later, Coventry had their best chance in the half, and Gikiris was played clean for on goal. But his initial shot was saved by Long once again. The rebound bounced off the striker as he went to the ground, but it rolled narrowly wide of the target. Yes, that was very, very lucky for us. Uh, Gikiris was played through. He ran through. Long came out, narrowed it down. Uh, the geezer, Gikiris, kicked it towards goal, hit Long, bounced back off, hit the striker, and went towards goal and oof, just narrowly wide. Uh, it felt like Mill's best chance was going to come in the stroke of half time after George Savile won a free kick around 25 yards out. Fleming took Hame, but he smashed the ball miles over the bar. Yeah. Much to the amusement of the home supporters, truthfully, it summed up the line's first half performance. 
Uh, the referee took centre stage in the early stages of the second half. And it's fair to say that he wouldn't be fine in the Valentine's Day day in the Coventry Building Society Arena, given his trigger happy attitude to yellow cards and his controversial decisions in crucial moments. Ten minutes into the second half, he had given one book into Coventry and three to Mill Wall. In the 58th minute, one more breeze past two midfielders after cutting inside from the left flank, setting the honeyman uh, in the middle of the box. He was shoved down by McFadden to a huge roar from the away end. Nothing was given up. He shoved down. I think, was that the one where he pulled on his arm? He pulled him down. Uh, I think that was McFadden who did that. A near identical moment took place at the other end of the pitch soon after, but the referee was unmoved once again. Uh, Coventry eventually found the breakthrough in the 66th minute. After a sustained period of pressure, Mill's backline looked to be caving in, but they were undone by a moment of magic. The Akira's picked up a pass from Callum Doyle and spun past Cresswell, rifling a powerful shot into the bottom corner from 25 yards out. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about the goal uh, while we're here. So this is a thing that, a pattern of Cresswell's, uh, Cresswell's behaviour that he needs to fix if he's, if he's going to progress in his career. Um, he did this against Sheffield United in, in the FA Cup. Uh, he's did it now. I think he's did it early in, in other occasions in uh, the season as well. I can't remember off the top of my head where. But So, Cresswell comes out to the player who's got the ball. He closes him down, moves towards him, gets body tight. Sticks his ar arms, doesn't put his arms on him. But his arms are there. And then he starts sticking his leg in, and he's off balance. And as he, as it says there, he the sky spun away from him. Um, it happened at Sheffield United. He was off on his own on the flank, covering from Murray Wallace, I believe, who was further forward, and he had to come across. Um, uh, so that was he got the same thing happened there. He got done. You've closed him down. You can't let him get past you. See, he needs to look at the occasions where he's done that before. He needs some coaching. So someone at me all needs to show this to him. They've got the video analyst guy or whatever. They need to show this to him. Where he closes them down, he gets up to him, and he just starts hacking, getting his leg in, trying to get the ball out. And they just like push him off and they, they're gone. So he needs to either see where the ref is and say, okay, can I pull on this guy's shirt or do something like that? Um, just tangle up his feet so the guy can't run away from him. So it looks like he's trying to get the ball. He's trying to tackle him and get the ball, but he puts his feet in in a way that the guy, guy can't uh, spin out and just brush him off and go past him. He has to kind of take an extra touch. He needs to look at what he's doing. Because this is a pattern that seems to, I, I think, is, is uh, in Cresswell's game. And, and when he's 19 years old, this is when he needs to be coached. And he needs you need to look at this and say, okay, you need, you need to fix this because this is going to be a problem. Um, but yeah, but here's the thing. The one, the, the one in the cup against Sheffield United was out by the corner flag. But this one was in the middle of the pitch. So I'm not putting it all on Cresswell, but it's it's the similar thing that he's done. But there's like two other players. There's a whole host of Millwall players behind him. Uh, I think Murray Wallace and Savile I might be wrong. And then the guy spins past him, and then he's just like it's like he's threading it through the eye of a needle. He's a very good striker, Gurus, and he just threads it through. And maybe George Long was unsighted because of all the Millwall players standing in front of him. And I I guess they they figured that they had close down all the angles and that if there was a shot it, it wouldn't do anything but it did it went into the into the goal and that was it on 66 minutes so uh, it prompted Gary out to make a double change yes let's try and play so this is the old it seems like we went back to the old Gary Rowett um like try and play for a nil nil if we get a sick piece we we might we might get lucky and then as soon as we go a goal down, it's like, okay, the nil nil's off the table. Let's actually try and play and win this game. Or, or get a goal and get back into it. 
Um, that's. Oh, it's so frustrating. It's kind of like famine mode. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it's like you're scared. It's like, I don't know. It's like, what would you say? It's like pussy. It's, you're acting like a pussy. Can I say that? But you know what I mean? It's like, you're, you're too defensive. You're holding back. You're like, oh, you're afraid. You're, you're fret. Like, why are you doing that? I guess was he played played at an unchanged eleven. He think they would be tired, so you told them to hang back and sit back and not try too hard, not press too hot, too high. Um, but who knows, man? Who knows? We'll we'll probably we're gonna gonna read Garrett's post match comments afterwards. So maybe there's there's a comment in that. I don't know. Uh, so it prompted Garrett to make a double change, bringing on Oliver Burke and August Volsama. For Honeyman and Watmore, despite a handful of chances, it took until the 77th minute for the visitors to properly test Ben Wilson, with Cresswell powering a corner into the goalkeeper's gloves. Yes, that was our first chance on goal. First chance on goal, 77 minutes. Uh, Mill will understandably dominate the closing stages of the game with their best chance coming with five minutes to go. Uh, the Lions tried to scramble a corner over the line with Burke fluffing his shot for fellow substitute Jamie Shepperton, brought in an effort at goal. Uh, Bernie Loney, Luke McNally was on hand to clear it off the line, maintaining the Sky Blues lead. 17-year-old Romain S.A. had the, best, uh, the last chance of the game, rushing cold shot narrowly wide of the post, with Coventry seeing out four minutes of stoppage time to pick up all three points. Yes. Um, so, the end of that match report kind of glosses over. Uh, Romain S.A. was like, it was like a drop of water in the desert. It was like sunshine on a cloudy day. I mean, Romain Essay coming on, the way he was playing, um, was just a revelation. And uh, some people saying he should start the next game. He did look a bit gassed out. Um, but here's the thing. After Coventry scored, they just sat back. And we unleashed, probably because Burt came on, that helps with his pace and stuff. They just sat back and we just went wave after wave after wave, many of which the main essay was involved in. Um, so he would be a bit gassed out because it was just constant, constant pressure and going at him. But here's the thing, if you start Romain essay, the game's not going to be that intense at the start of the game. It's going to be a bit edgy a bit cagey especially against a team like Sheffield United um, so we'll see but now here's the thing I, as I said I've got I've got a little confession to make actually um, so when the team was announced at 645 and I saw that it was an unchanged 11 uh, I had a bet on commentary to win I doubled it up with uh, AC Milan to beat Tottenham of course and uh, I made uh, a week's wages on that bet. So I wish I hadn't, but you could see what was coming. And I think the way it happened before in the, in the season was, um, I think it was a Watford game, a Boxing Day game. So we, had, we played on Boxing Day, and three days later we played Bristol City. And I think that was quite similar. So on, on Watford, uh, the Watford game at Boxing Day, Probably our best performance of the season. Absolutely stunning. And then you go to Bristol City. The fans are going there because it's our, I think it's our only home game during the Christmas period. Um, because the Luton game was postponed or something. That game was such a dire game, nil nil. And that's similar to this, where you've got two games in three days or four days. You can't play the same team twice. Now, Coventry, I had a look. They made two changes. And the changes were Bidwell. Bidwell came in. Norton Cuff, Cluffy came in. It was one of their best players. Norton Cuffy was probably one of their, their best players, to be honest. Uh, certainly attacking-wise. Or you could say gear carries. But in terms of um, effort and uh, product, Norton Cuffy. Probably because he wasn't uh, 
marked out of the game as much as Gikira's. But yeah, so they made two changes. And they looked completely a lot fresher than us. Um, and But their changes were enforced. So if they had gone the same 11, it might have been a nil-nil or draw. Because they had a player injured, and they had a player sent off. So that's why they made two changes. But there you go. Um, so let's carry on. Uh, takeaways. All it takes is a moment of quality. While Coventry were the better team on Tuesday evening, it was far from a routine win. We all put them under pressure and managed to frustrate them, but nowhere near enough to pick up a positive result. Ultimately, Gear Kira's screamer made the difference. His goals like that often do in the championship. The Lions have seen that often enough with Fleming. Uh, they simply don't have enough, uh, don't have any of those moments in them tonight. Uh, what, was it wrong to stay unchanged? Yes. Yes, it was. At least two changes like Coventry made. I mean, come on. And you see it. When the subs did come on, so Romain Essay was fantastic. But Shackleton was a bit. Like he got the ball got stuck under his feet when he was in the area, cause he needs some time. He might need some time to get into the game, and you're throwing him on. Say go, you're winding him up. Click 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 click, and then you send him off, and he's got to go. Uh, given Mills' performance and result against QPI, it made sense for Rout to leave his side. Any change? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. It doesn't because there's a game on Saturday, and there's a game on Tuesday. That doesn't make sense. It literally doesn't, especially when we sign two players. You li you literally, you start one of the subs, and then the player that you've put on the bench, he comes on as a sub. That's you you doing the same but opposite. So where Watmore started and then Burke come on, you start Burke and then bring Wat Watmore in, or something similar. It's just the same but in reverse. Um. So in hindsight, it probably wasn't as his front line were unable to stretch Coventry's defence enough to cause them any real issues. Uh, the likes of Vogel, Selma, Burke and SA will be high at start against Sheffield United. We certainly do hope so, don't we? A tough test to come. It felt like Mill needed to get something against Coventry given what they face next at the uh, Sheffield United travelled down on Saturday lunchtime. Yes, Saturday lunchtime. For some reason, Sky... I, I hope they turn up on Saturday because they said twice... That the Millwall game would be on Sunday morning. They said it on the on the bottom graphic, and then they said it on like the thumbnails where they say the, the next game's coming up. No, the game's on Saturday lunchtime, twelve thirty kickoff. Uh, before Burnley visit SC sixteen next Tuesday, meaning that the Lions will be coming up against the current top two. Avoiding defeating either of those games will be seen as a fantastic result. But losing both could knock them down a the table. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Um, but here's the thing. Look. I'm disappointed at the performance, not the result, because we often go to Coventry and lose. And to be honest, we've won our last two away games in a row. And I've, I said in the, in the video the other day, our away, our away form, our away results so far this season is exactly the same as last season. So we've already got our, our away form is as good as it is now, 75% uh, uh, away through the season, and it was at the end of last season. So it's already it's already going to be better, which is what we needed to do. We needed to improve our away form to get up those extra points to get up the table. So we had already won against Coventry, uh, Cardiff away and QPR away. So winning three away games in a row... Um, that would have probably would have been stretching it a bit, but um, yeah, it's two tough games coming up now. So let's see what Gary Routes had to say. Because this is also from SouthernNews.co.uk. Gary Routes frustrated by cautious meal and one 0 defeat to Coventry City. The Lions managed an xG of just 0.1 in the first half of the Coventry building at the Coventry Building Society Arena. Oh. That's not good, but it's better than remember Blackburn away when we didn't have a shot on target all game. Uh, our XG for that was in the zero. So Gary Rout has admitted that Mill were a little too safe going forward in Tuesday's 1 0 defeat to Coventry City. Um, the Lions mustered just two shots on target over 90 minutes um, against the Sky Blues, while goalkeeper Ben Wilson was forced to make just one save. Um, Rout was frustrated that his side uh, looked lethargic. 
in the final third. Hmm, you know what lethargic means? It means tired. Adding that his side needed to deal with Giacchera is better in order to pick up a positive result. I think when you're going to do certain things, when you go away from home, he said after the defeat, when you look at the Cardiff game and the QPR game, I thought we defended really well and we showed a bit of composure when we needed it. Um, tonight you looked at Coventry and they looked like a team that really had the edge about them at the start. They did what we've done in so many teams at the 10. They started really bright, full of running. It looked like they were uh, more desperate to start the game well. I think sometimes you just accept that. It's disappointing. But it took us a while to get into the game. I felt that when we did get into the game, we moved the ball side to side to our full backs, which was the obvious out ball. And we kept going backwards or sideways. It just felt like we were being a little too safe. Against a side like Coventry with Geek Hughes up front, what you can't do is give balls away and leave them space against defenders. Because it's very, very good at utilising that space. They've got other good technical players, but at times tonight, we looked an immense threat on those transitions. Did we not deal with him well enough, or is it just a, a really good player that seems going to struggle to deal with? I don't know. If you want to keep a clean sheet and get someone out of the game, you've got to keep him quiet. I thought he looked a handful all night. The goal is probably a testament to that. He brings it down, turns one way, wriggles back inside, and hits it from 30 yards. I think the ball just goes around Coops and it and sights Longy a little bit. It's a great finish, and you have to applaud that bit of skill. It's poor form from us to allow him to do it. I think that was a disappointment up until the goal. Um, so yeah, it looks like Long was on site according to Gary Rowett. Um, yeah, I think that's so, all we've got so far from Gary, Gary Rowett. I'm sure there'll be some uh, more post-match comments and, and stuff to, in tomorrow's papers on Wednesday. And then on Thursday and Friday, we've got to start looking forward to the Sheffield United home game. Um, so the club have put this up. Let me just go back up. Bid on Coventry City versus Millwall match worn shirts. Yes. Do you want to wear? Um, do you want to buy an historic shirt from that one 0 piss poor uh, defeat at Coventry City? Well, you can do that. Uh, match worn shirts from Millwall's game with Coventry City are now up for auction. Sports can bid on the shirts worn by the starting eleven and substitutes. Perhaps yours long goalkeeping shirt takes your fancy, or maybe Zion Fleming's top is the one for you. You can place your bid on any of the tops now. To view the shirts and to make your bid, click on the link, link um the blink on the link below. Auctions close at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, the 21st of February. So on the day of the burn game. Good luck. Good luck. Um so here we go. This is matchwornshirt.com. Uh go on there and search for Millwall. And you can see. The leader so far is Zara Fleming of 332. The boy certainly attracts plenty of attention in the shirt auction game. And next is uh, Tom Bradshaw, Jake Cooper. Everyone loves Jake Cooper, though. Lovely shirts. He's up there as well. Everyone else is a bit, uh, I think, on the starting bid, which is around £79. Um, Romain Nesse, 103, number 50. Um, might be one to, to watch if he turns into a superstar. He's just got a Gary Rout's got to pick him and put him in a team for him to uh, show what he can do. But uh, there you go. So if you're up for that, here we go again. Um, I think the last one of these was was it the whole game, uh, the Remembrance game. Well, not all. There was one after that as well, wasn't there? Um, yeah. But here we go. Or do you want a, a, a match issued Ryan Leonard shirt? So that would be totally fresh because he didn't get on the pitch. Um, so you've got six days and 17 hours to get into it. But uh, if you want a Zion, Flem Zion Fleming shirt, I think you've got to be a bit, uh, a bit, have a bit of wedge about you because that's probably going to get up to about 700, I'd say, probably five, 700. So now. Move, double match day today, and not really much going on about because I think the media guys travelled with the first team up to Coventry, so they were live tweeting it, but it was basically the bare bones, goals and substitutions and stuff like that. So, um, Millwall home to Watford. Uh, it was 
at the training ground. One thing of note was a Domi Maku wearing a number seven um, played 45 minutes of the game. So the team was uh, Joe Wright, I think that's Ollie Evans, uh, Malaki, Penny, Grant, Okali, Imaku, Cotton, Leahy, Abdul Malik, Drozd, um, and the subs were hurt. Um, George Evans, the goalkeeper, not the old man, uh, Massey, Alan Coleman, and the subs that happened were. Hearn came on from Maku. Um, Allen came on. Alfie Allen came on. Finn Cotton, and I think it's Massey. Is it Massey came on for Penny? I think those were the substitutions. Um, and the actual score was one-one. This is from SofaScore.com. Like I said, there's no match report yet. Um, there's not even from the Watford team. The Watford team didn't even put out the team on Twitter. They literally ghosted the team because the team is rock bottom of the league. I think they're trying to avoid the, um, the embarrassment that is uh, Watford under the 21s. Which is no fault of their own, to be honest. Uh, I don't want to dig the kids out uh, at Watford. Um, basically, when Watford got Watford got relegated from the Premier League, all of the under 21s just bailed out, and they were left with um, basically a second string. So, what can you do in that situation? Uh, where are we? So it's reset itself. I did have it set up, but it keeps resetting itself because it uh, keeps refreshing. So as you can see, there's a, they scored. For, uh, we scored first, 31st minute of Abdul Malik, which I believe. So that got no pictures, uh, got no, got no nothing. Uh, it's just, it was described to us as a, a goal kick from Joe Wright, which went through to Abdul Malik, who ran onto it, took it through to goal, and, and scored. And then they equalised on the 36 minutes. I have no idea what that was or how it happened. I think uh, Watford put the ball in the net on the seventh minute because that was on the that was a goal in the lab books uh, in play, but they chalked it off. So, like I said, I have no idea what the hell went on there, but it was a one-one. So another draw, and this is Millwall to 21's fourth draw in a row. Much like the first team, they've taken to drawing at home. They drew against Watford today 1-1. They drew uh, uh, last time out, Queen's Park Rangers 2-2. They drew against uh, Charlton Athletic 3-3. That was a away game. And they drew at home all the way back in December 3-3 again. It's crazy stuff going on there. Um, what that does to the table is it leaves it looking like this. Now, second, so in this situation, uh, they just need to finish second to go through the semi-final playoffs, which is the two the two teams at the top of the Southern League play the two teams at the top of the Northern League in terms of second and first. Second place first and second place first. Um, so we just got to finish second, that's it. And if we do that, if we do finish second, we will probably end up playing Sheffield United. Well, are absolutely steamrolling everyone else in this league. Uh, they've got 40 points and then it drops to 27. So we probably might want to finish top of our league just to avoid playing Sheffield. But then we've got to play them in the final anyway. So, com si, com sa. When do you want to take your medicine? Now or later? Um, so let's get back to the Southern League and just have a look. And see, so we're second. Uh... Four points above Reading with a game in hand. I think there's like seven or eight games left. Um, so, there you go. Um, remarkably, still on being at home though. All those draws. Five wins, four draws, no defeats at home. And away from two defeats, uh, Swansea. And Reading, who decided to play Andy Carroll. Yes, former England international. 34-year-old Andy Carroll playing for the under-21s. Uh, how's your luck on that? But there you go. So they haven't they they haven't been beaten for a long, long time. But they just, they haven't won in four in five games. They keep drawing. 
keep drawing, which is, is they've been weakened because players have gone out on loan. They've they've lost uh, Aiden Muller, they lost Bisa Top Lodge, they lost Isaac Loffey, who's he played a couple of times so far this season for them. Um, so obviously they lost Romain SA. Uh, he jumped straight, basically straight from the under 18s to the first team. Um, so what can you do? What can you do? You just got to keep on carrying on, and uh, hope for the best. Hope the team spirit gets you through. So now this was put up this morning. This is from LondonNewsOnline.com. It's going back. It's, they're talking to Zion Fleming about the QPR game. Now the reason why I bring this up is there's a line in here that I wanted to share with you. So. Dutch attacker Zion Fleming claims a new first in a 2-1 win over QPR. I told you about this the other day. So Zion Fleming was happy to pick up the first Mill assist of his career in a 2-1 win over QPR on Saturday. Yeah, but his first assist. He scored 10 goals, but he hadn't set anyone up. Which, you look at it and you think, what is he selfish bugger? What's, what's happening there? The D Dutch attacker's pass was rammed home. By Duncan Watmore to put the lines ahead at Loftus Road. And manager Gary Rack felt Fleming's decision not to go down under a challenge from a fast player in the build up paid off for the 31st minute opener. Fleming told the South London Press I got a knock with his knee, it's still hurting a bit, but we were in a great position, so I don't tend to fall down, especially if we're in a great position. I'm happy with the assist, it's in my first one of the season. Finally, one has been finished off, and I'm buzzing about that. He took it really well, but the only thing that mattered to me was to see the net moving. Now, did you see it? Did you see it? Did you feel it? Did you feel the um, tension in the quote? So obviously this is written down. I don't know how he said it. Maybe he was joking. Maybe he was a bit flustered and a bit pissed off. But I'm happy with the assist. It is my first one of the season. Finally. One has been finished off, and I'm buzzing about that. Finally, like he's spraying, like he's spraying around, like he's messy, and they're all all the donkeys around him are just falling over or just skying the balls over there. Um, he has set up a few people, uh, but Ferry brings comes to mind. Maybe a few for Bradshaw, but he's not like he's not he's not messy where he's like pinging balls around. He maybe does two or three a game. Um, so, but an interesting line there. Like I said, I don't know. It's written down, so I don't know the uh, tone that he said it in. But seems a bit, is he a bit pissed off with the quality of players around him? Now, obviously, we've got Burke, who is a player that went for 15 million smackaroonies. So. If we got Burke playing up front, and then you got Fleming behind him, is Burke gonna be a bit more tuned in to the quality of Zion Fleming and the balls that he's putting around? Will we see uh, Fleming get more, a few more assists? We got Burke scoring, assisted by Fleming. Is that is that the future? I don't know. So Mill secured their fifth away uh, win of the campaign and first at Loftus Road since 1989. Fleming felt he saw the good value for maximum points. They were dangerous at times, but we created enough chances to get the win, and we scored two goals. We conceded one, but normally we don't even concede one. So if you concede one or two goals against us, then you're not going to win. It was a really big performance and a great win. We all do not have loads of loads of time to recharge as they go again at Coventry City tonight. As long as you win, you always recover a bit better, because you're happy, said Fleming. It's the best medicine. So there you go. Just wanted to share that line with you, Fleming. Um, finally, finally, someone's taken on one of the passes that you've put on, put on and put it in the back of the net. So interesting thing. Then now we're going to finish the video up with this, which is uh, a bit of a bummer to be honest with you. It's a bit of a downer, but uh, interesting story nevertheless. Part of this morning on BBC News, BBC.co.uk. Um, there's this guy here, the Londoner who visited every tube station before he loses mobility. 
why am I bringing you this? Is, is this a Millwall? Uh, is this a Millwall channel or is this a Charlton channel? All right, calm down, calm down, calm down. Uh, a Londoner spent months visiting all of London's tube stations in a bid to make the most of his mobility and to raise awareness about his medical condition. Ben Spencer, 49, who lives at the end of the central line, suffers from ataxia, a progressive and degenerative muscle disease. The former bouncer and Millwall season ticket holder was told in July that he would probably not be able to walk in a year's time. Oi. Due to his love of the London Underground, he set himself the challenge of visiting all 272 tube stations. Mr. Spencer completed his challenge on the 10th of February, finishing at Tottenham Court Road, and has now set himself an even bigger challenge. And there he is, there with Gary Rout. Mill fan Mr. Spencer bumped into Gary Rout, who manages the lines whilst on his challenge. Damn, how's your luck? Hey, nice sunglasses there from Gary Rout. Uh, he had some difficulties with walking and speech for the best part of 10 years, but lived unaware of his prognosis until July of last year. So he's had this for 10 years, and finally, they said, oh, this is what you've got. He said, the early, sympt the early symptoms started many years ago when I started to have difficulties walking, he told the BBC. But I struggled to get a diagnosis. It was a mistake from everything to a tremor to arthritis. While I was glad to finally get a diagnosis, the type I have is a quite insidious kind, uh, progressive cere cerebrella, uh, cere cerebella ataxia. I was told this may be my last year of walking. Uh, I'd never even heard of it, and I felt really alone. Mr. Spencer, also a keen photographer, always enjoyed uh, regularly using a tube, often boarding at Buckhurst Hill in Essex to visit the library. Wanting to make the most of the number of days he had to use all of the network, he decided to visit and photograph every single station and document, document his journeys on Instagram. Uh, his condition gets worse if he is more sedentary, and he says if it were not for getting out and about, I almost definitely wouldn't be walking at all. Um, despite this, the condition has progressed faster than he had hoped, and what he thought would take in three months has taken five. With his mobility unpredictable from one day to the next. Despite these difficulties, he says he's come to love uh, the network more than ever. I did like using a tube beforehand, it's an iconic part of London, but now I would uh, consider myself a total tube nut. I absolutely adore it. It's absolutely fascinating learning about the history and the architecture as I go. I also have made uh, many friends doing it and found a real community. Asked if there was a station he liked the most, he picked the Grade 2 listed Sudbury Town Station on the Piccadilly line between Brent and Ealing, which he describes as a beautiful old building. Uh, now that Mr Spencer struggles with noise and crowds, he sometimes seeks refuge at the quiet Roding Valley Station on the Central Line in Essex, where if you miss a train, you could be waiting 15 minutes for the next one. Uh, with support from charities Ataxia UK and Ataxia and Me, his main goal was to raise awareness about the rare condition uh, and frequently misdiagnosed disease, which affects 1 50,000 people. Uh, is that worldwide or just in the UK? Uh, the symptoms of ataxia, such as poor balance, speech, vis vision, and swallowing, are often associated with many other neurological conditions. Mr. Spencer, who walks with two sticks, can still manage the tubes escalators. Although with some difficulty, he says he has become very aware of the accessibility issues at many stations. He intends to hammer home the need to improve this for the capital's wheelchair users, and he will be documenting the second challenge to visit every London tube station in a wheelchair. Uh, this, Mr. Spencer says, could take up to a year. Uh, further afield, he, is also, he also has ambitions of making his way as far up Mount Snowden as he can in a wheelchair. Ooh. There you go. Um, ataxia. So basically it's a brain condition. I think it's kind of like MS. Uh, multiple sclerosis. But it's hard to diagnose. And I don't think I don't think they can do fuck all for you anyway if they can. So I mean, what, what's the point of diagnosing it uh, if there's nothing they can do for you? Quite well, sad, but there you go, he's 49 years old and he's facing uh, the rest of his life in a wheelchair.
through no fault of his own. So there you go, ataxia. Um, crazy stuff, huh? And on that note, thank you for watching and goodbye.